tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The grass is completely destroyed. Should happen for sure. Protest or unpermitted party? Safety concerns at Vancouver's 420 event also. Concerns if something goes wrong. Booze on board that concern over BC Ferries' plan to sell wine and beer and... Delayed, the federal government puts off a decision on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. With just two days before Vancouver's unpermitted 420 event, safety concerns are mounting. But as Mickey Cowan reports, it may be too late to make any changes. It's an annual event, 420, that's unlicensed, unsanctioned, and doesn't have a permit. Still, it draws the crowds at Sunset Beach in Vancouver's West End, and it has a bit of a reputation. The grass is completely destroyed. There's a lot of garbage that ends up in the sand and in this public park. When it was around the art gallery, you could smell smoke. Uh, from like three blocks away in every direction at least here you don't smell it as much you get a little wind from the water. There's not much to see just yet but in a couple of days this area behind me is going to be completely transformed with vendors a huge main stage and tens of thousands of people. And this year a performance by hip-hop band Cypress Hill is expected to draw even more. While marijuana is now legal, smoking in parks isn't, and the event has no permit and no insurance and a giant stage. I can say I have some huge concerns. City Councillor Melissa DiGenova says it's a safety issue. She wants to see more plans in place in case of an emergency. We look at some of the stage collapses of the past. Public safety has to be paramount. Councillor Michael Weeb says city engineers will make sure the stage is secure, but he says the lack of fencing to keep youth out of the event is a major issue. Youth drug addiction and drug overdoses is the number one killer of youth in 2019 so far. Weeb wants on-demand addiction services for youth on site. Vancouver police say they'll arrest anyone caught selling drugs to minors. I think the city can't really do anything about it because there's so many so people many down, people, yeah. like, there's so many people down here, like, what, are you just going to arrest, like, all of them? No way. This Langley resident plans to go, and she thinks it's up to each person to take care of themselves. You always got to know who you're buying from and what you're buying in specific because, like, you never know. It's such a dangerous thing. And with the event just two days away, any changes will have to happen quickly. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Vancouver. Concerns tonight about BC Ferries' plan to offer beer and wine on sailings this summer. Critics are worried about the potential for increased impaired driving. We've heard from our customers that some of them would like to enjoy a glass of wine or a beer with their meal on uh, board our ferries. So uh, again, we're trying this out for a few months and we'll assess the project as it goes. We have a zero tolerance policy for impaired driving and we do have good relationships with our CMP. So if we do suspect someone is intoxicated, we do communicate with them. The pilot project does come with some rules. There is a two drink maximum per passenger and it has to be consumed with food in the Pacific Buffet. Still, some aren't convinced it's a good idea. I think there are some specific concerns that have to be considered about the use of alcohol in the particular context of a, um, a, f a ferry that's transporting a, a very high proportion of people who are going to get out and drive afterwards. Uh, one or two drinks uh, will make some people impaired drivers and it depends on your body size, your tolerance to alcohol. Stockwell says the key is to keep alcohol's consumption limited to the set regulations. Mad Canada wants to see more training for staff beyond simply the serving at right certification because it says being on a ship presents different challenges. It says it's a different entity. You're on open water, there's not police enforcement, and you have more passengers around in a confined area. The beer and wine will start flowing in June. Well, Ottawa is delaying its own deadline to decide whether to go ahead with the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Federal government says it needs another month to consult with First Nations before making a final decision. But as provincial affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher tells us, many Indigenous groups claim an extension won't make a difference. 
Trans Mountain has become the crossroads for three political narratives. A new face in Alberta's fight to get its resources to market, a B.C. government digging in its heels to block the project, and a federal government facing an uphill pre-election battle. Now a final decision on the flashpoint between them has been delayed in the name of more consultation. So we have been uh, engaged with the Indigenous communities for uh, over the last number of months. Ottawa has already met with more than 100 communities between the bookend cities of Burnaby and Edmonton. But now they say they need more time to continue those conversations with First Nations leaders and are confident four weeks is enough. Not only continue to engage with us until uh, uh, we reach the decision, but also to comment on the, uh, on the draft accommodation and consultation the report that will be released to them in a couple of weeks. But some Indigenous leaders claim more consultation won't change anything. Well, the federal government's going to be stuck with a, uh, a landlocked pipeline. She says the process has been fatally flawed from the beginning. They bypass continually the proper title holders and collectively in our nation, which are the people. So their process is still very narrow and it's still not really addressing the issues. As for opposition on a provincial level, B.C. is waiting in the wings, having made its case to the courts. The Premier hoping they find favour with the government's jurisdictional argument. We made our compelling case that British Columbia should be able to regulate uh, toxic substances that could impair our environment. Uh, we've made that clear. I made it clear to Mr. Kenny again. And so enters a new opponent to the ring in Alberta, Jason Kenney picking up where Rachel Notley left off. Fresh off an election win, he's been the most vocal politician in advocating for the expansion to go ahead. Yet a more subdued tone from the incoming premier on word of yet another delay with the project. I agreed with the Prime Minister that they need to make sure that they cross every T and dot every I when it comes to discharging the federal government's uh, duty to consult. Frustration not so subtle from stakeholders in this response from the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. After more than five years, at this point, every delay means damage to the Canadian brand and lost jobs. Yet the industry will have to wait some more at the mercy of a federal government deciding on the fate of a pipeline it's already purchased. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. It's a plea for justice spanning two provinces. As Jose St. Ange reports, an Edmonton mother whose son was murdered in Surrey almost two years ago is asking for information that could lead to the arrest of her son's killers. Tanner Krupa was 19 when he died. The Edmonton man had just moved to Surrey, B.C. for work at the time of his death. Police say he died after an altercation with a group of men. He was found dead in a back alley. His mother, Kim Krupa, is asking anyone with information to come forward. Tanner deserves justice. If you have any information about Tanner's death, no matter how small or insignificant you think it is, I'm pleading with you, please, with you as a mother who has lost her only precious son, to please come forward. Please contact IHIT or Crime Stoppers if you wish to remain anonymous. Any piece of information is so important. Police say Tanner Krupa didn't have a criminal record or gang affiliation. They believe that people that know about his death have since moved to Edmonton and they're asking them to come forward. People that wish to stay anonymous can contact police through Crime Stoppers. Jose Saint-Ange, CBC News, Edmonton. Three world-renowned mountain climbers are missing and presumed dead following an avalanche near the B.C. Alberta border. American Jess Ross Kelly and Austrians David Lama and Hans-Jörg Auer were ascending House Peak in Banff National Park when the slide hit. Parks Canada says one body has been spotted from the air amidst avalanche debris. House Peak is considered an exceptionally difficult climb. Recovery efforts are currently on hold due to the ongoing avalanche risk and dangerous conditions in the area. RCMP believe eight fires at an elementary school in Nanaimo since the starting of this month have been intentionally set. The first and largest dates back to April 3rd. Crews arrived to find the school's basement filled with smoke, forcing an evacuation and causing $5,000 in damage. Seven more fires have been set at the school grounds since then. Anyone with information is asked to contact Nanaimo, RCMP or Crime Stoppers. Well, on Saturday, half a million people are expected to fill the streets of Surrey for the Vesaki celebration. It's the largest event outside of Punjab. And as Belpiri reports, hand in hand with the big crowds comes even bigger business. 
For merchants, it's the busiest time of the year, the lead up to Vasaki. For shoppers, it's a spending is no object time for items in high demand. For mangoes, uh, for example, it's, it's doubles. Uh, that, that one weekend, and for all the trays and, and the chana flower and atta, it, it goes up to 30 to 40 percent higher. Staff is doubled and warehouses are stocked. We have to have uh, three to four delivery per day to a store because our store does not have that much capacity of storage. Uh, so we continue to fill up the store during the day. Three times a day we sell the, uh, send our trucks out. The food frenzy is just one element of the economic impact of the festive occasion. Looking fresh is another. We start seeing inquiries around early March. People start asking for orders for Vasaki when the next shipment's going to roll in. Shipments from India take at least eight weeks to get here. Retailers start to plan Vasaki inventory as early as November. So we bring in suits that are mostly orange, blue, and yellow in color. So those are the Khalsa colors, as some of you may know. Every person wants to get a new suit for this event. No doubt, Visaki is a lucrative time for business. Exactly how lucrative, no one can say for sure. In 2014, it was estimated that the Visaki weekend generated $30 million in spending in Surrey. But there hasn't been another formal economic study since then. And in the meantime, the size of the event has more than doubled. Last year's crowd was estimated at nearly half a million people. On the actual day of, doing business might actually be tough. We work closely with other members in different communities to assure them and let them know exactly what Vasaki is, how it runs. But if I had a business on that street, of course, there would be a downside for that day or a day leading up to all the setups because it does get crazy out there. Because the procession attracts visitors from across North America, there's an even bigger business boom after Vasaki. And they also come and shop a box lot, a tea, atta, uh, sugar. So there's a lot of box uh, sale that happens for out-of-town out people who come and load up for their next six months. Vesaki may be a time to celebrate religion and culture, but it's also a time to buckle up for business. Belpuri, CBC News, Surrey. Well, three years after the province declared overdose deaths a public health emergency, those closest to the issue suggest BC is coming up short when it comes to training experts on how to treat addiction. As Eva Yugen Senj reports, a Vancouver program has been trying to fill that gap and is looking to expand. Naloxone injections are saving lives from the overdose crisis, but experts say addiction treatment starts long before an overdose. We know that physicians that are poorly trained uh, can be unsafe with their prescribing of opioid and other medications. The BC Centre on Substance Use started training health workers nearly six years ago. Since then, it's grown into North America's largest addiction medicine training program, right here in Vancouver. Graduates of the program say it addresses a critical need. Not knowing as a physician how to respectfully bring up someone's substance use, how to counsel them around how to reduce their use or um, strive for abstinence. Uh, and the fellowship allowed me to develop those skills. Trainees are paid by the regional health authority to spend a year learning how to diagnose and treat patients dealing with substance abuse. Only half of this year's 60 applicants were selected to receive the training, including physicians like Dr. Sukhpreet Clare. When I was doing my family medicine residency, I, I saw addiction and sort of related um, things on a very, very daily basis, and I really got to see how pervasive addiction is in our, in our society. He spent time on the front lines of the crisis in the downtown east side and also in clinics and community health centres across the lower mainland. All my patients who come in with any sort of addiction issue, I can provide them with the right medications, the right treatment, the right referrals um, that will help them through their substance use disorders. Wood hopes the training will receive government funding so it can be offered in other municipalities dealing with the crisis. If we don't invest in the training of healthcare practitioners like we do for other diseases, then that information just sits on the shelf and it doesn't get employed in the healthcare system. When asked by CBC about expanding the program, the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions didn't make any commitments, but said it does recognize the work being done by the Centre on Substance Use. It also said it's working to expand a network of primary care across BC. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver.
Facey's top doctor, meanwhile, tells CBC she's pushing for new measures to help those grappling with addiction. Last week, I asked Dr. Bonnie Henry to reflect on the crisis and talk about the strategy going forward. Each bundle contains a tourniquet, two alcohol swabs, two syringes, one water, and one cooker. Every day, hundreds of these bundles are being used at safe consumption sites. This one in Victoria opened its doors almost a year ago. I toured the facility recently with BC's public health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry. They've had over 46,000 visits since it opened. Um, there's an average of three to four people a week who um, have overdosed at the facility. And like all of our facilities around the province, there have been no deaths associated with any of our supervised consumption sites or our overdose prevention sites. So that's, you know, that's one of the important things for me. These are, these are critical needs and they're working to keep people alive. Still, people are dying. In fact, about four people die from a drug overdose in our province every day. 1,500 OD'd last year. And we know that if we had not put in the measures that we have, like these overdose prevention sites, supervised consumption, the naloxone program that we have, that as many as 4,700 more people would have died, which is, um, which is frightening. Next week, Dr. Henry will release a report pushing for more measures to tackle the ongoing public health crisis, like pharmaceutical alternatives to street drugs and decriminalization for simple possession. We now know that many, about 80% of the people who are dying now are mostly young men who are at home and they're using alone and they're not telling people and their families and friends tell me that they, they didn't know they were using or they didn't know they had relapsed. And, and part of that is shame and part of that is stigma and it's fear. It's fear of getting a criminal record, of being thrown in jail. Of course, drug laws are under federal jurisdiction, but Dr. Henry wants the province to divert addiction-related offenses from the legal system and instead connect people with health resources, something those on the front lines say has been neglected for too long. And for the estimated 115,000 people in BC dealing with opioid disorders, the kinds of measures that could save their lives. And as we told you earlier this week, there are uh, growing calls for a uh, uh, so-called safe supply of drugs, mm -hmm. and I expect Dr. Henry is going to address that in her report next uh, Wednesday. All right, we'll be mm -hmm. watching for it. And if you missed any of those stories, you can find them online at cbc.ca slash bc or on our YouTube channel, CBC Vancouver. <laughs>
that President Trump engaged in obstruction of justice and other misconduct. Contrary to the Attorney General's statement this morning, on obstruction of justice, the report doesn't exonerate Trump, nor does it recommend charges. It does suggest, though, that it's up to Congress to pass judgment. Much of the report fills in details about events that were already public knowledge, but Democrats say there are still a number of critical questions. Their next step, get answers from the man we've yet to hear from publicly, Robert Mueller. They've requested he testify before Congress next month. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Washington. The president of France is honoring the hundreds of firefighters who battled the blaze that tore through the Notre Dame Cathedral on Monday. Emmanuel Macron praising the firefighters for their courage. He thanked them for helping save many of the priceless relics and preventing further damage by the fast-moving fire. He says the firefighters will get the Medal of Honor. It took about 14 hours to put that fire out. And today, an anonymous French official saying investigators think the cause was likely an electrical short circuit. Donations to rebuild the cathedral have already surpassed the equivalent of a billion Canadian dollars. Okay, we're going to get to the weather in just a moment. We want to introduce you to our newest meteorologist, Brett Soderholm. Hi welcome. There, Nita. Hi. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you. And, uh, well, we can dive right into it. What's happening for this weekend with the weather? Well, after a week of pretty well terrible weather, by anyone's account, we're actually going to be dealing with very sunny conditions for Saturday and Sunday. So I know there's a lot of fun things that are going on this weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got Visaki. We've got all the celebrations okay. down at Sunset Beach. It's going to be a nice one. So I'm happy to be the bearer of good news nice. here. <laughs> all right. But with that said, let's take a look at the day that was, uh, it really wasn't that nice. I mean, this is not something that anyone would really want to reminisce about. I'm pretty sure about that. Lots of rain. It may as well be underwater for all that it's uh, looking like right here. But it is all out of our system, and we are going to be dealing with much better conditions as the week goes on. Now, with that said, we do still have a it's a rainfall warning in effect right now for the Fraser Valley. So this is going anywhere between Abbotsford, Chilliwack and Hope. This was issued by Environment Canada uh, under the assumption that we could be getting anywhere between 40 and 70 millimeters by the time that Friday morning rolls around. But if you're not in that area, you're going to start to see a clearing trend. So as we get into the overnight period, watch for the rain to be easing for the lower mainland, Vancouver down towards Surrey and Delta. Slightly higher elevations toward Maple Ridge and R Mission it could be getting a few more mills like that in and around that 20 to 30 range. But I I wanted to give you all of that good news that I promised here. We've got a weekend planner put together here what you can be expecting across the lower mainland for your long weekend. So for Good Friday, just wanting to mention first thing in the morning, expect those showers to still be continuing, but we're going to be clearing into the afternoon. And look at this. Haven't seen this guy in a little while. That's our sun. We're finally going to be getting temperatures in and around 15 degrees. Get out there and enjoy whatever plans you have on Saturday for Easter Sunday as well. It's going to be a mix of sun and clouds, but again, temperatures around that 15 degree mark. So nothing to be concerned about there. I'm very confident about the way this forecast is going to play out through the weekend. We've got nothing expected precipitation wise across the region on Saturday. Only going to be watching for the return of some rain by the time that we get into late Sunday and into Monday. Of course, if you've got any pursuits out into the backcountry, be aware that the avalanche danger rating is both considerable or high in some locales. But here we have our five day forecast and we're going to be able to take a look at how even the next week is going to be playing out. Beautiful weekend, as I mentioned, but for Easter Monday, there's there's going to be that risk for a few more showers returning to the region. Same thing on Tuesday. Temperatures are going to be taking a little bit of a dive again. All in all, though, that's, uh, that's a pretty good weekend. I know. Oh, Certainly compared to what we had, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you can't ask for much more Saturday, Sunday sunshine. Exactly. That's great. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right, well, that's it for our newscast tonight. Um, you can catch us on television, though, after the Jets-Blues game. Yeah, probably sometime around... 820. Well, we don't know actually. It could go into overtime. It could get, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for now, thanks for watching. Have a good night.